welcome everybody and I appreciate you all for attending this evening's discussion on an alternative to the United Nations, the Covenant of Democratic Nations, hmm. that will hopefully spark con uh, continued conversation and future policy changes impacting the U.S. involvement in the United Nations and the international order more globally. For those who aren't familiar with Emmet, which means truth in Hebrew, we are an unabashedly pro-Israel, pro-American think tank that prides itself on challenging the falsehoods and misrepresentations that pervade U.S. Middle East policy. Sarah Stern, Emmett's founder and president, and her terrific staff worked tirelessly on the Hill providing pertinent information to Congress to make informed decisions that will improve our national security and that of our greatest ally, Israel. We are continuing to expand our New York presence and I host various events throughout the year. We cannot continue our work without your support, and I ask you all to consider helping us make a difference so that we can continue our critical work, including holding these types of events. Uh, before I introduce our panelists, I do want to recognize a special guest who is with us today, Ambassador Danny Ayalan. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming. And uh, thanks the uh, four or five people who were good enough to cancel because of weather. <laughs> it's always good to know how many are coming. Um, we're going to have uh, a, a panel discussion about the Covenant of Democratic Nations. That is an idea to replace, to defund and replace the United Nations with a new democratically principled uh, or world body, one which may even sunset itself. Um, and this would uh, uh, this would review, reform, readopt, strike, strike down, and clarify uh, all prior international law um, and UN actions, especially if they involve the Middle East. Thank you very much for coming. We launched uh, about a week ago in uh, the House of Representatives. Uh, we had. Um, uh, with uh, Representative Trent Franks. We have a website called covenantofdemocraticnations.org. This is our second event. Next week I'll be in Palm Beach also moderating. Mark Langfen will be with me. Then I'll be in San Francisco. Then we will. I will also appear before the Australian um, Parliament and Sid, uh, then in Canberra, Sydney, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No one up here represents the Covenant of Democratic Nations, huh. nor is anyone part of the committee for the, de for the Covenant of Democratic Nations. We're only part of the conversation. So what we're going to do is try to uh, talk about why it's necessary and what can be done, what, what can be done about it. Thank you, everyone. Last year I spoke on a panel at the United Nations addressing the rise of global anti-Semitism. My initial reaction to the invitation was one of surprise given the location. Then I learned that it, the conference was actually sponsored by the permanent mission of Palau, one of the few nations that votes consistently with the U.S. in the General Assembly. As I entered the U.N. that day, I searched for, uh, for the tapestries portraying the eight secretaries general at that adorned the walls of the main visitor's lobby. The tapestries are proudly displayed as donations by none other than the Islamic Republic of Iran. No mention of its role as the world's largest state sponsor of terrorism. What nation does the UN repeatedly and obsessively condemn? Israel, the only democracy in a region of the world in which terror and tyranny reign under regimes that sanction the torture and murder of the citizens while suppressing speech, thought, and basic human rights. Last year, the General Assembly adopted 20 resolutions against Israel while passing only six <laughs> against the rest of the world's nations, and certainly none against its precious Palestine, which has been granted permanent observer status. One of those anti-Israel resolutions was actually drafted and co-sponsored by Syria and accused Israel of repressive measures against Syrian citizens on the Golan Heights. This is insanity, and yet the world does not just refrain from action. Citizens of the world actively participate in this obscenity. At 22 percent of the overall UN budget, the US, the U.S. contributes more than any other member state for a grand total of $8 billion annually. What do we get for this investment? We get one vote along with the 193 General Assembly members and a vote on the Security Council, which has been in... in which has been inviting terror sponsored regimes such as Syria, Libya, Turkey, and Pakistan to join the others in stymieing the U.S. interests. U.S. money is abused by nations hostile to us to deepen the pockets of tyrants who vote against us. At this point, it is simply impossible to justify the existence of this massive bureaucracy that is more self serving than peace seeking and democracy supporting. 
For those under the naive belief that the UN's various peacekeeping and human rights missions qualify as substantial enough reasons to keep the UN afloat with its billions of dollars of waste, think again. <laughs> think of the Iraqi oil for food scandal and the cash for Kim scandal. Think of the Durban World Conferences Against Racism that provided a platform for hate speech including calls for death to the U.S. and to Israel. Think of the hundreds of millions of dollars final to UNRWA, which UN expert Claudia Rosette refers to as a veritable welfare enclave for terrorists, with its 30,000-person staff that used the funds for Jew hatred indoctrination. Think of UNESCO's resolution that did not recognize the Temple Mount as Judaism's holiest site denying thousands of years of history and heritage. Think of the platform it provides to Iran's despotic leaders to rant before the world about its desire to wipe Israel off the map while denying the Holocaust and supporting Syria, Hezbollah, and Hamas in their effort to surround Israel with armies bent on her destruction. And let's not ignore the rampant and ingrained corruption that defines the UN bureaucracy. This fraud is so embedded in the inner workings of this self-serving international body that is interest, uninterested in distinguishing right from wrong or good from evil and incapable of performing any legitimate purpose other than swallowing US dollars and spewing them among our enemies. And then there are the peacekeeping missions from 2007 to 2013. The UN reported more than 600 allegations of rape or sexual exploitation, many involving minors, committed by its peacekeepers stationed around the globe. I have a friend who has dedicated his life to working for the UN's various peacekeeping missions. He recently emailed me as he has decided to resign his commission and he stated, I do hope the new US administration will take a serious grip on the UN over spending, corruption, and many other questionable acts. Myself, I am leaving this organization with a bad and bitter taste in my mouth and will certainly not support any of their programs. This organization should be dismantled, kicked out of the US <laughs> if they want to survive, and maybe replaced by a more down-to-earth system not using all this money for zero or little results. The UN is a swamp that cannot be drained. It is too infested with corruption and hate. It is too full of anti-Semitism and moral vacuity. Mm. We now have a new administration in the White House, one that puts America first. Unlike his predecessor, who used the UN to empower tyrannical regimes, Trump has an opportunity to include in his legacy a rearrangement of world order by removing the U.S. from the morally repugnant farce that is the U.N., and to unify the world's democracies under a new institution that encompasses nations and individuals with a moral compass that is not broken with the vision of right and wrong based on Judeo-Christian values and with leadership interested in making and helping mankind survive the never-ending war of good versus evil, the worst of which I fear has yet to come. Thank you. Um, so first I want to start with a quick story. Uh, a few years ago I went to a divestment hearing at one of the universities near Los Angeles. I think it was in San Diego, but I've been to quite a few divest... At the beginning, I used to attend them and torture myself. Um, and uh, it was going on literally for hours, as they do. They can literally go all night. The kids really just sit there, and uh, our side suffers so greatly. They cry. They, I mean, it's, it's just painful. And the other side is all, you know, they're having their, their you know, party, uh, their fest. They're bullying Israel with every uh, sentence. And I had, like, I had to get up, and, and after five hours, I had to get up. So I go ahead, and I, I go to the elevator, and in walk, you know, three of the, the uh, young uh, people who were making the case against Israel. They get in the elevator, and they didn't know where I stood, but they said to me, can you imagine that the pro-Israel people are trying to discredit the United Nations? <laughs> Now think about that. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have on campus, and, and really in other places too, is that the United Nations, aside from everything that you just read, everything that we know, UNESCO, everything that is so unfair, and how they ignore the, the people around the world who really need them so badly, that the tragedy is that they have credibility. They have credibility. And, and among the millennials, they have credibility. And even our side doesn't quite understand, well, do they have credibility? The kids. Or don't they? You're looking at me funny. I mean the millennials, the kids on campus that, that don't know. They don't know. So it's up to you and me. It's up to us to make sure they do know. So this needs to circulate. So thank you very much for that presentation. Just a couple things I want to say, and then I'll, I'll yield. Um, so there are two films that I want to recommend to all of you here. One is Broken Promises. Uh, if you haven't, just write, write these two films down. I think you can find them on the internet easily. Broken Promises is an excellent, serious film about the United Nations, Broken Promises. The other one is You and Me, which is a half-serious and half-funny film 
uh, a la Michael Moore kind of film, but not Michael Moore, obviously. Uh, and so uh, I'd like you to see that. It's, uh, it's kind of an entertaining way to learn facts about the United Nations. And that film, by the way, is very good for millennials. We've actually taken Ami Horowitz and that film around to campuses. Also, before I uh, stop, I would like to offer these to you. We were motivated to, um, to create this piece. Stand With Us is known for our materials. We, we create them for high schools and uh, campuses, churches, synagogues. So please ask us when you need things. We'll send them to you at no cost. Uh, this is, uh, what does UNESCO know that everyone else doesn't? And so I invite you to take these uh, before you leave. And also the United Nations and Israel. Uh, this piece is being updated. Uh, it's actually printed in 2013, but it's a historical, so you can get your facts also from this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edward. It's great to see everybody here today. Uh, I'm going to give you a three-minute presentation on everything that's wrong in the world today and how to fix it. So let's see if I can do that in three minutes. Does everybody have their hand out in front of them? It says the future of Western civilization. Raise your hand if you don't have it. Everyone have it. Okay. So I'm going to explain everything that's wrong in the world today and where um, an alternative to the United Nations uh, would fit in. Um, this, uh, uh, some of this material is taken from my website, SaveTheWest.com, which you all should subscribe to. Just put your email address in. The key problem is Western civilization is under attack from the inside and outside, the enemies within and the enemies outside, and we have to have different strategies for different enemies. And the key solution is we need a government and politicians who can do three things at the same time, maximize growth of the economy, protect the people intellectually, culturally, legally, and protect the people physically. It's not complicated, just most countries can't do it. For example, Europe can't do it. Uh, it uh, the United States couldn't do it for the last eight years, it's going to do it for the next eight years. Uh, and Israel does a pretty good job at it. Okay, so that's the summary. Let's go to page two. Uh, everyone here, uh, this is color-coded, and everyone here is a yellow rational center. It's yellow means for sunlight, sunshine, uh, uh, um, the values of Western civilization. Page two. And uh, um, because you believe in the rule of law, constitution, bill of rights, and uh, right or wrong, good and evil, and I'm very proud of every one of you, and congratulations, you should sit, feel very good. We join the other one-third of the population who are normal. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, two-thirds of the people are not normal and they believe in false narratives. There's four major false narratives surrounding us today. The left, so color-coded for the Reds, socialists, communists, progressives, who believe that uh, instead of God being God, the government's God. And they've replaced God with a government. That's a false narrative. Then we have the Blues, who believe the United Nations, or in Europe, the EU is God, and that's a false narrative. And then we have the, the isolationists, the whites, who believe that the oceans are the God, and oceans will protect us from bad guys, bad people. And then we have Green for Political Islam. I monitor the four worldwide political Islam terror organizations who promise to take over the world, or as they would all agree, Christian Jews and Hindus will convert to Islam, or we're going to kill them. The four worldwide terror organizations are Iran, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Muslim Brotherhood, and the Wahhabis from Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. So, the question is, how can we yellows do better in the future than we're doing right today? Only one-third of the people are normal. If we did our job, at least two-thirds or more of the people would be normal. So let's go to the next page. Let's look, spend a minute on the United Nations, page three. This was taken from the David Hurwitz Freedom Center, written by Daniel Greenfield. Ten reasons to abolish the United Nations. I thought he did a good job. And... Uh, United Nations obstructs America's defense of the free world. United Nations is a force of global injustice. U UN obstructs prevention of genocide. UN distorts women's rights. UN cannot prevent, uh, prevent nuclear proliferation. The UN is undemocratic uh, and a perversion of democracy. Number seven, the UN is hopelessly corrupt. Number eight, the UN is an economic drain. 
Number nine, the UN endangers American civil liberties. And number 10, the UN holds human rights, rights hostage to its double standard. So what is the solution? Let's go to my last page. Page four. So, page four, well, what I did is I replaced. It's easy to do this <laughs> with, a, with a, uh, a computer. It's a little harder to do it in reality. But I replaced the United Nations with a covenant of democratic nations, uh, eliminated all dictatorships, and uh, no state sponsors of physical or cultural terror, and made the United Nations normal, so to speak. We'd have to eliminate about two-thirds of the countries, but so be it. And then, if, if then the United Nations were normal, so to speak, and joined us, the rational centrists, we'd all of a sudden go from one-third to perhaps a half of the population that's normal on our way to 70 uh, or more percent of the people normal after we take care of the other groups some other day. Thank you for your time. Climate of partition resolution. If you look at all of the testimony that was given in favor of the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine, actually, the, ironically and actually, the most eloquent testimony was given by Andre Gromyko. And he said very plainly that the world owes the Jews a debt for standing by while six million were murdered, and we can redeem that debt by giving them a home. Now, of course, the Soviet Union at the time, in these early days of the United Nations, believed that Israel, because, let's face it, uh, many Jews from Europe who survived were Bundes, and they established a, pretty much a socialist nation. The Histadrut could, could close down the country at any time. They felt, oh, these are our comrades. <coughs> these people are going to be just like us. Of course, thankfully, uh, Israel did not evolve that way, and, but it took quite a while. It actually took uh, more than 40 years for Netanyahu to straighten out the economy there when he was finance minister. But that said, there was a concordat, a relationship, before the establishment of the bloc in the UN, uh, which would later be composed of the, uh, the Organization of the Islamic Conference and the Third World Bloc more generally, and headed, of course, by the Soviet Union and the Eastern European satellite states that would eventually come to oppose Israel. And this happened somewhat gradually. Uh, you saw the establishment of the PLO uh, in 1964 by Ahmed Shukeri later on Yasser Arafat, and by 1967, when the rest of the Holy Land was liberated by the Israelis, this is when you had the formal break, and this is when all the trouble started. And it was not because of the, the accession of the territories which, which uh, should have belonged to Israel in the first instance, but rather because now there was a realization that Israel was becoming much closer to the United States. It was Johnson who really made the full commitment. Uh, he wanted forbearance on the part of Israel in June of 1967, but he has uh, said in several uh, texts to have, have told uh, Levi Eshkol something along the lines of, but if they start with you, you can kick their ass. So he kicked their, we kicked their ass a little bit early. But the question that I would have for all of you is, it, it's less so from my point of view to make the case against the UN because everybody here is making that and will make that. There's plenty more. If you want to make the whole case against the UN, we could be here a very long time. But the question is, because of these alliances that you have, why do, you, why do these alliances now endure? Well, as, as I said a couple of weeks ago when we were demonstrating against the French for hosting the conference, which would, in their view, lay out boundaries for a future settlement, and then, of course, Obama had the intention of trying to, to formalize those proposed lines mm -hmm. in perhaps another UN meeting or perhaps another resolution, mm -hmm. but the reaction, thank God, was so overwhelming that they decided to just drop it. If the UN would cease to exist, what would cause France, for instance, to become more amenable to Israel's cause? They have 10 million Muslims, and they have 500,000 Jews. 
Why do you think France conducts itself the way it does? Why do you think Marie Le Pen has a very real chance? And frankly, at this stage, I'm not going to accuse her of being her father. I don't think it could be worse for the Jews in France if she were premier. Mm. But why does she have a chance? Because the people are fed up with an overwhelmingly hostile population, which doesn't assimilate, which has no go zones and so forth. And we can continue this down the line, but these alliances evolve either from Muslim nations that, for their own internal consumption, cannot recognize or support Israel, from the Western states, which are infiltrated by large numbers of hostile people and desiring the votes of those individuals, and all of these other characteristics of the states in the alliances which oppose Israel today in the UN, how would we get those legitimate democracies to agree to abandon those alliances and those allegiances and suddenly support Israel in a new covenant of democratic nations? I think that's the real question, because if you overcome that, then you can move to the step where this becomes a realistic possibility. Thank you. And of course, the, the first question is where to begin. And uh, well, the historian in me is going to say 1945, and the lawyer in me is going to say with dashed hopes. And what I actually have here, if everybody sees this very tattered document, it's a copy of a monograph that was prepared by Clark Eiselberger, uh, who was known as the father of the UN in 1945. And in it, among many other things, he said that the UN represents a desire to found the world organization out of those who represented the moral forces against aggression in the Second World War. High hopes indeed. As Bernard Lewis uh, has said on many occasions, well, that's all great, but the United Nations uh, failed in 1948, and ever since that has continued to fail. And that brings us to the subject of international law. Specifically, what is it? Uh, my, my grandfather taught me that we always cite uh, those who have come before us, and so I've got to say that that Nathan Lewin uh, said it very well uh, already last week at the DC, con the DC panel, where he questioned what is international law, specifically public international law. Well, really, what is it? Uh, the UN General Assembly was never meant to have lawmaking power, uh, no matter how many times they attempt to do so. The Security Council, uh, well, its power isn't really based on, on law per se either. It's based on uh, what might be called a relic of the Bentham era uh, notion of nations with sovereignty and power, leveraging it against each other. Well, as an attorney, obviously, that doesn't seem very legal to me. Well, how could you end up with an organization that does have the capability of real law? Well, if every country is democratic, and they're all democratically agreeing to be bound by the same rules and regulations, and to create something very unlike the General Assembly, well, then perhaps there's a chance. And that brings us to the concept of lawfare. On a national stage, it's been attempted here through the use, uh, misuse of libel laws in particular, and ultimately it didn't get anywhere. Why? Well, we have a legal system that's designed to weed out that sort of thing. If you have a strategic uh, lawsuit against public participation, that's grounds for dismissal along with sanctions. But when that same sort of thing is done on the international scale, well, there, there really isn't any sort of mechanism that's comparable to what we have domestically. That's the problem. The United Nations can't fix it. It wasn't designed to fix it. It was designed and born out of the best intentions. But best of intentions don't actually work. They don't work in the real world, and they certainly don't work in the legal world. Um, and so in order to move past that, in order to move past the, the dynamic of the United Nations, which, again, began out of, out of the best aspirations. Uh, my, my wife, Ileana, couldn't be here today, interned at the UN once, and then went to law school, and uh, let's just say her... Uh, her reaction to hearing about the UN has changed very dramatically as a result. Uh, would, would agree with me completely on that. And so, in two minutes, there's not really much time to get into as much of the theory as I would like. But again, if we're going to move past this, this notion of leveraging power, of blocks of nations, of nations with uh, greater economic power that can be leveraged at a given time, the three warfare strategy that China has been employing as a soft power uh, maneuver in the South China Sea in particular. If we're going to actually think about moving past that on a new dynamic and moving past what, what Grotius and, and Devato and Bentham 
and pretty much everybody else who's been dead for 300 years talked about with the primacy of the nation state, it really does have to begin with fundamentally democratic principles. Perhaps we have a chance, I, I certainly hope so. Now, uh, everybody, I handed out these two uh, graphics before I, you know, so everyone should sort of look at these two graphics real quick. Uh, I want everyone to understand what the stakes are, as far as I see. Uh, we are in an existential battle, not just for Israel, but for the United States and for the free world. And uh, the center of this battle is the UN. And I was a journalist there for a little bit, and I can tell you that the UN is uh, an asylum where the lunatics are in control. And how am I going to make such a bold statement? I'm going to make such a bold statement by actually giving everyone here sort of a very simple way to actually engage in mind-to-mind -mind combat, as well as answer Jeff's question. Because Jeff asked the critical question, how can we convince the Europeans? Or really almost how we, can we convince Americans that Israel is in the best interest of the United States? Where in effect, we are essentially saying that the UN is engaging in this quote unquote two state solution, which I believe they all know as the ones, the zero state solution. Meaning they don't, the UN does not see the two state solution as the end game. Let's just all understand that. It sees it as the middle game to the zero state solution with no Israel. So what I've done here uh, is essentially create a relatively simple map that I've actually used in congressional offices. And I'll tell you a real life story. I walk into a congressional office about five years ago, one of of Republican, very concerned about the budget. The uh, woman looks at me and she says, my congressman is only concerned about the budget. Oh, so I first put down my topographic map on the desk and I've got my plexiglass piece out and she looks at me and she says, my congressman only concerned about the budget. You have 15 minutes, go. So I look at her and I say, so okay, Let's just get this straight. You want me to explain to you why Israel is worth more to the United States budget alive than $3 billion in 15 minutes. And she looks at me and she sort of gives a gentle nod, yes, because that's actually what was on her mind. So I said, okay, and I actually pulled out a, a facsimile of the map that you see on this postcard. And what this postcard and what that map up there represents, if I can just scoot over here real quick, is it's sort of a very cartoonish answer to Jeff's question, which is why do the Europeans care? Okay? And the answer is really actually very simple. If you look on your postcard, you'll see this blue line over here. Okay? Now, on this map, which excludes uh, Malaysia, uh, India that has 200 million Muslims, uh, Nigeria, just on this map alone, there are 350 million Muslims to the bottom right of that blue line. Okay? Above to the left of that blue line is 11 million Greeks. And so I showed this to the congressional staffer. And I looked at her, and I said, okay, if you take Israel out of the picture here, you've got 350 million Muslims now having absolutely nothing between them and the NATO country Greece that this United States is sworn to defend. How much are you going to have to, as the budget person, put into the United States budget in years two, three, four, and five? She looks at me and she says, you just bought yourself another 15 minutes, okay? So the point is, I then went on to show her the very simple thing that's on the back of the postcard, that the Katusha rockets that they're now firing from the Gaza Strip, 
could be easily smuggled into a demilitarized West Bank without Israeli border guards, into the blue rectangle that holds 70% of Israel's population and 80% of her industrial base. So right now they're firing missiles sort of into North Dakota equivalent in Israel. If they had the West Bank, it would be firing from Brooklyn into Manhattan. So with that, I'll just relieve, but the, the concept is the Europeans have got to be made to understand that Israel's the appetizer and they're next. The League of Nations began after World War I as a combination, it was begun by the victors, as a combination of, a combination of revenge, a desire for uh, granting self-determination as a means of, dis, of uh, dismantling the uh, German and Ottoman empires, uh, a, um, uh, a desire to, uh, to create nations where none existed, and all of it was floating atop the greed for oil. And so the United Nations, in concert with Anglo-Persian Oil Company, now known as British Petroleum, created nations where they never existed to facilitate self-determination, which was a legitimate aspiration, and also to make sure that the oil flowed down two pipelines, one going through Lebanon and one going through Haifa from Iraq and Iran. It had a high-minded idea of being a peacemaking organization. Of course, the United States never entered it because Article 10 was rejected by the Congress, which called for concerted action to um, uh, enforce, and they felt that they could be dragged in to, uh, to another war. It became useless to stop the rise of Hitler. It actually facilitated, through its uselessness, through its acquiescence, in the rise and dominance of the Nazis in the Third Reich. After World War II, once again, the victors assembled to create some world body to create a democratic, principled effort to bring world peace. That body was sick from the moment it was born with five members of the Security Council France, the United States, the United Kingdom, and tyrannical communist Russia, and civil war torn China. It was doomed from the outset, and through its own expansion, inclusion, uh, proliferation, it brought in scores of additional nations to who were undemocratic, who did not believe in democratic ideals, to the point where the most undemocratic countries, such as uh, Afghanistan, North Korea, had the same equal voting rights within the General Assembly as the democratic nations of the United States and Great Britain. In fact, some of the most democratic nations that now exist on planet Earth are not part of the Security Council. So this organization has had nothing to do with Middle East peace. I can tell you that the Camp David Accords were not conducted in Geneva under the auspices of the United Nations. They were conducted in Maryland under the auspices of the White House. I can tell you that when a peace was achieved with between Israel and Egypt, the United Nations vetoed a peacekeeping force and it had to be assembled as a MFO, multinational forces organization from contributory countries. I actually was the first one to visit some of their obscure outposts uh, in this um, uh, demilitarized zone. They have uh, blocked all efforts to uh, facilitate uh, uh, a two a two state solution while they claim they want to and they ignore the historical facts distort the historical facts and those historical facts are that the intention after world war 1 
uh, enshrined in the League of Nations Covenant in the mandate adopted unanimously by both Houses of Congress and all the nations of the League of Nations, re-enshrined in Article 80 of the UN Charter, <clears throat> was to create four Arab states and one Jewish state. Actually, originally it was three Arab states and one Jewish state, but then they clocked off 80% of Jewish Palestine and invented something called Transjordan. And that was done not with an army, that was done not with a vote, that was done with a memo in September 1920, a mere memo by Churchill. Where do we go from here? Okay, to create a covenant of democratic nations, this is a conversation we're having today, last week, and next week. But we could not have had this conversation last year. Mm. And that is because there is a new impetus to do things correctly and decisively. Mm. The organization that I have in mind, and I don't represent the organization, um, uh, I, I don't represent anyone except myself and my ideas, is to gather around just democratic nations, create a constitution, broken democratic nations like Lebanon could enter, non-democratic nations such as Egypt and Pakistan and uh, other nations could enter as associates or uh, observers and aspire to a higher, loftier ideal, just as uh, Turkey cannot still get into the EU uh, without uh, abiding by certain norms. The government would defund the UN even when the League of Nations segued into the UN, it transferred $8 billion of assets into the new body, defund and replace. Many people think we should just take our marbles and our checkbook and go home. That is not the answer. Then there would be no moderating force in the United Nations. It would just become a satellite of the Arab League and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. We need to stay in the UN, defund it, and watch it, and watch it as it dissolves and collapses on itself <laughs> and move into this new organization, the Covenant of Democratic Nations. We need A, defunding, to tra transfer the funding to the new enterprise, a congressional resolution, an international conference, and from the international conference, we need an international convention. These are the actual aspects of the treaty. And from the international convention, this convention would then be adopted as a treaty similar to the UN Participation Act and the countries who agree would be bound. We have an opportunity to do that now. It's on everybody's lips. And that is why I've been working 24-7, and all these other people have agreed to come and, and, and participate now. Now is the time, and if we understand the route, we have a true opportunity to proliferate the idea that world peace, or peace as we would like it to, to be, to the best of our ability, can be um, effected by a world body based on democratic principles, that would have an actual constitution and that would try to proliferate the very ideas that we all hold um, uh, ideal. And uh, this would include, of course, not just the South China Sea, not just Rwanda, not just Srebrenica, but also Israel, which is important to each one of us. Thank you very much. Oh, I've got to answer no, and thanks for the pressure of putting me in his shoes. <laughs> That's great. Um, the answer, the answer is no, and, and even even if we were to resort to the use of treaties as the example, uh, to draw a very rough analogy, you know, a, a treaty is basically a contract between nations. Well, when a contract, whether and how a contract is enforceable in a domestic legal situation, well, you you have a superseding law. In terms of what is generally called public international law. Well, we're actually dealing with a relic of several hundred years ago where they were positing 
Well, each sovereign state, that's its natural state. And when they can find agreement, that's the basis for law. Well, as uh, J.R. Briarly put it in his, uh, in his book, The Law of Nations, well, that actually moves it out of the realm of jurisprudence and into political science. And that's pretty much where it's language for the past 300 years. We call it law. It's not. It's leverage power. It's convenience. It's a whole bunch of things, but I, I wouldn't call it legal. Right. Uh, it's one word. It's, it's education. Uh, again, we were motivated to put this together years ago on the United Nations. Uh, because of all the things that we've heard here today, all the disappointment, all the broken promises, um, all the unfortunate countries that have been neglected because of the United Nations obsession with Israel. And we should speak like that. We should speak like that about the United Nations. It's obsession with Israel, with an average of 18 resolutions a year against the state of Israel alone. Uh, and what a sham of uh, the Security Council. But anyways, um, so the, the answer is education. This is why we print uh, booklets like this. This is why we just produced this. So I would just encourage everybody, everybody in this room can become a teacher, um, can at least give two, three facts to the people you know, particularly the young people you know. Uh, encourage them. Don't try to jam it down their throats. That's never going to work, not with your friends and not with kids. It doesn't work. What works is inviting someone to just take a look at three or four facts and encouraging them to take a look deeper into, into what you're talking about. That works. Let them come to their own conclusions. But, but meanwhile, we have this as a resource for you so you can use it. Education is the key. Thank you very much. Yeah, your question is, is there any hope for normal people when two-thirds of the people are not normal? Yeah, that's the question. <laughs> so I, I have a theory that normal people should be two-thirds of the population, uh, not one-third. And it's our job to convince half of the two-thirds to become normal, to become yellow, to join Western civilization. Now, um, you're, many of you are probably saying, gee, that sounds difficult or impossible. Now, what if I told you in 1942 that I had a theory that Germans and Japanese could become normal? You'd say, excuse me, there's World War II going on. The, those two countries are run by lunatic organizations, and uh, there's no way in the world they'll ever become normal. Okay, in 1946, they became normal. Now, unfortunately, 60 million people had to die uh, for that, uh, for those two uh, nations to flip from uh, lunatic, uh, abnormal nations to normal. So it can happen. Unfortunately, it usually happens with a lot of dead people. Uh, I'm hoping it happens uh, with rationality and logic rather than a lot of dead people. Could it? Okay, well, let me just go back a little more into the past. Uh, 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 Russia. If we were talking about Russia in the 1920s or 30s, or... Or, or 40s. Yeah, 40s, or, or communist China at the time of Mao, and I said that they'll kind of, I won't call them exactly normal, but they're at least half normal. They have one foot in Western civilization, and if we play our cards right, there's no reason why Russia and China can't join Western civilization. So that's an example, of again, of people, uh, uh, without killing millions of people, Russia is trying to become normal, and China did kill millions of people, but uh, they can be brought into the fold too. So I think it is possible. Also, look, look at Egypt and, and Jordan. And if we were talking in 1948 while the bombs were falling, and I said, you know, I have this theory in 70 or so years, uh, uh, Egypt and Jordan are going to be close to normal countries. You'd say, that's ridiculous. Can't you hear the bombs there? And they're blowing up all over the place, and the soldiers. So it can happen, but the West has to stay strong. And, and, uh, and normal people have to stay strong intellectually and physically in order to um, uh, bring uh, the uh, abnormal people into the fold. All right. You have a different problem. Uh, so when I worked for Pataki, I served on a number of public boards. One was called, one was, uh, is called, 
the United Nations Development Corporation. This corporation was put together by New York State about 50 years ago to facilitate the presence of the UN, uh, which had a better reputation 50 years ago, but primarily because it was regarded and is still regarded by the state and city as an economic benefit to the city and state. So the idea is to facilitate uh, the purchase of property for diplomatic missions, uh, apartments, uh, locating apartments, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, there was also the Council of Corps, which relates to all of the parking violations, all the things that have to do with the UN being here. Under the headquarters agreement. Yeah. And, and, and as I said, it was, this was an economic development question. So I come to this board, <laughs> my first meeting, and... I'm looking at, uh, there's an overview of the agency who works there, and they had uh, the board chairman since the inception. And uh, so I look and I see there's a fellow there, he's very familiar, he was chairman 20 years before I got there. His name was John J. McCloy. I said, that name is so familiar. Germany. Yeah. So John J. McCloy <laughs> was the undersecretary of war to Henry Stimson. And he was the fellow who, when appeals were made by the various rescue committees and the World Jewish Congress and others, that they didn't care how many Jews would be killed in the process because it didn't matter at that point, 10,000 Jews were being killed per day to bomb the rail lines to Auschwitz. It was McCloy who wrote the report to Roosevelt that said, oh, no way we could do this. It'll be a diversion of, of resources. And right now the only thing we got to do is we got to win the war. Of course, they were bombing oil fields five miles away. He didn't tell the president that. But anyway, the point is, we facilitated at that time the $5 billion renovation of the UN, primarily with U.S. funds. <laughs> there is about 8 to $10 billion of real estate involved in New York alone. So it's not just the budget. Do you know a real estate developer in Washington? It's not the point. If we have to discuss and we have to understand, I'm, I'm all for this. I, don't, I, can't, it, I could use a four-letter a, a four expletive to describe the UN. <laughs> Generally, when you go to the UN and you listen, you listen carefully, you will hear excrement speak. Right? Oh, wow. <laughs> so... The point is, it's not just the budget, and it is possible for the United States to chip away little by little. I mean, I was looking while you were speaking at Nikki Haley's introduction at the UN, and she said, we'll fix what we can, we'll get rid of what we can. And I believe Trump is prepared to start to cut away 50, 100 million at a time. Will he get to the whole 22%? I don't know. But you have to take into account it's not just the budget. If, if there were a move to create a covenant of, of democratic nations and supplant the UN, how do you switch title on that $10 billion? Probably the same way the League of Nations. Do you leave the bad up? nations in there and you get out and go somewhere else? That wasn't $10 billion at the time. That was makeshift. That was eight, right. It was makeshift. Okay. Well, that's a great point. Thank and you very result, much. That's only New York. All in New York. They got Geneva, got all the other outlets. Surely there must be a Washington aspect to that. But so. ours is the biggest share. We have $10 billion of real estate, minimum. And now, I just want to understand, who owns that real estate? Mm. It's international territory. Wow. Mm. You're talking about the missions? No. no. The, the land, land, the, land yeah. just the, the buildings, on the East everything West. from, from the, the two Republic. apartment houses at 860 UN mm -hmm. Plaza, mm -hmm. all the way down to the southern mm -hmm. end, where the plaza ends at the FDR, that is international territory. Right. It does not belong to the United States, right. and neither do the buildings constructed thereon. Right. So, so how do you get it? That's the headquarters agreement. They're going to say, screw you, we got the votes to keep it. Well, they could keep the place without, just telling you. Okay, without air conditioning. I mean, we could open, <laughs> we could open up a covenant in my office or here, okay. but we won't we, get We are opening it in your office. Uh, I would say a huge part of it is fake history, but it's even a lot worse than that in that there's, uh, when I walk into congressional offices with my maps, uh, there's zero history. 
There is zero understanding of where the countries are. Mm -hmm. I have just simple cartoon maps, and after I show uh, a congressman, a senator, or a staffer, you know, here are the countries around Israel, and what's going to happen if you pull Israel out? There, this one's going to be that one. That's going to go, and. There's no disagreement. Do you get the impression that anyone that you talk to in Congress and other informed people understand that uh, Jordan was created out of 80% of Jewish Palestine from three underpopulated Ottoman provinces? You see, you're, you're, you're already in PhD land. <laughs> as far as they're concerned, I show them this and then I ask a simple question every single time. And whether it's a senator or a congressman or a staffer, I look them straight in the eye. I said, I got a simple question for you. And they look at me. I said, okay, you have 435 congressmen. You bring them into the chamber, you give them a pencil, and you give them a blank piece of paper, <laughs> and you ask them, draw a stick figure uh, map of Israel and the countries around Israel. I said, I, I, I guess I did a simple little stupid way, you know, like I'm so yes, a question. Out of 435 congressmen, how many could draw a stick figure map of Israel with the countries around it? I have never had a single person tell me more than 35. Okay? This is, it is wasteland. It is this, the, the desert, the factual desert. So every time I walk in, it's the same thing. They look at me. And they say, I think right now people are beginning to question what the facts really are and what the legitimacy really is. <laughs> they, they, they look at it and they say, okay, I put down my map, they look at me and they say, okay, we don't want you to think we're stupid, but we know zero. Please start from zero. All right, thank you. It, um, full disclosure, international law is not my, my forte. I turn to others, Eugene Kontorovich and Avi Bell, and, and people who I admire a lot on, on those fronts. Uh, you know, I can speak personally to how I feel about international law and the UN. I mean, thank, thank God, the, you know, Resolution 2334 and, and others that have been um, passed over the years that are detrimental to Israel's security and ability to survive in a very hateful region. Um, are not binding by, by international law, and, and the the um, moral depravity of, of the UN can be seen, I think, most importantly with with, with Iran and the various resolutions and um, that have been that have been passed by by the UN that have basically been ignored, and Iran's on its way becoming a nuclear hegemon in, in the region. Um, you know, you can look at. at Resolutions that have been passed against Syria. I think there was one this past year, and again, it's you know they're they're really meaningless in terms of their effectiveness to um, impact uh, the the or, or to um, to stop the, the genocide and the murders that we're seeing, whether it's from from Rwanda to Syria today. So I think that you know until we have an organization where international law is something that is actually binding upon all member states. It, 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 it's meaningless. All right, um, Jess, how long have you been doing this? <laughs> uh, this project or in general? In general. Oh, okay. 50 years, but this project uh, probably 50 days. Wonderful. Looks like 50 years for this project as well. First of all, I want to commend everybody. I think it was very thoughtful. I think it was very thorough. And it's really a um, breath of uh, fresh air here in Washington, uh, and in Washington, here in New York a couple of blocks away from the uh, glass building, which I call the Babylon Tower, uh, we hear such uh, truth uh, unabashed. If I have to uh, ask the question is, what do you think, Edwin, or anyone that volunteers from the panel, what do you think the non-democratic country would do? And I think Jeff kind of alluded to it when it came to the how to, uh, to divide the properties and all that, but what would countries like, I don't know, North Korea and most of Asian, Latin American, Arab countries, what would they do once this UN dissolved and you create this covenant for democracies? Okay, that's an excellent question. What happens when the next shoe is about to drop? Exactly. So uh, I have a thought, but I'm going to turn it over to Jeffrey 
uh, Jeffrey, uh, um, you're a man of consequences. What happens when the good guys leave, form their own organization, and all you have left is some kind of residuum of the Arab League or the OIC, etc.? You you could have under the now this is all very theoretical. This our whole meeting is theoretical, but you could have a situation where let's say the top ten donor nations to the UN would probably comprise 70 to 80 percent or more of the budget, right? If in unison they got together and they went to the Secretary General and said, okay, it's over, you're fired. We're taking title here. The money that is funded by the non-democratic states, including those that are not aspiring to become democratic states, which could be a hefty number, as you know, that money, which is very de minimis, by the way, but funded by them, and those that aspire, which together might be 25, 30 percent, they could have observer presence in the Covenant building. Correct. They would not be possessed of any legal voting power. Correct. But they would have access to services that the entity could provide. Flood relief, starvation relief, WHO, all of that kind of stuff. But those bodies would be overseen and governed by the democratic states, which would which would get rid, presumably, of the perversities of, <coughs> of UNESCO not recognizing Jewish holy sites, and so on down the line. So you'd have to have, again, at least the largest ten nation contributors somehow take possession of this international organization, this international territory, and this international property, and convert it to the covenant. And then you have the other nations be administered with privileges of getting services, but not having any role in international governance, resolutions, and all kinds of nonsense. If I could just say that that's a, a, a brilliant addition for the uh, simple reason that many of the current UN agencies and organizations are actually, uh, uh, they're actually uh, um, a predecessor from the League of Nations. They're actually left over from the original League of Nations. And so if these other organizations which do good for agriculture, for health, for, uh, for, for overcoming plagues, if, uh, if these groups can be defunded <coughs> under the illegitimate UN and funded under the Covenant of Democratic Nations, it would be an inducement like trade, health, education, etc., science, it would be an inducement for them to abide by the greater ideal in the same way that the EU says uh, you can join our uh, community of nations, but only if you subscribe to these ideals. I, That's great. I just wanted to, to and, 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 uh, share and, and my, also. Uh, quickly my thoughts on this is that I, I think that it would be an unbelievable inducement to a, a change of behavior, as, as Edwin um, just said. But you don't. What most people don't realize is the vast amount of corruption and waste in, in the UN. And so when you defund not just UNRWA and other groups, which, uh, by the way, we, we fund, I believe, it's like 38% of UNRWA's annual budget, and the Muslim states combined fund 7% of it. I think the EU makes up the difference. Um, you know, that, that, I mean, that's insane. So if, you, if we're going to pull our, our, our funds from these groups, um, Iran, you know, is, has a seat at the table on the um, UN Development Organization, I believe it's called, the UNDO. UNDOP. And the DOP. And, and, and abuses those monies tremendously. So if, if we can prevent these uh, dictators from pocketing funds for themselves and preventing things like Iraqi, you know, oil for food scandals, then we can determine where the money's going. Not Iran, not Syria on these committees and, and deciding where the money's going. I think that's the key. The, the world, I think, could be helped a lot more if there were democratic nations deciding where the money was going. All right, thank you. Uh, through uh, various efforts that I can attest to, uh, various high-ranking uh, members of the uh, transition team uh, and the current administration are aware of these proposals as we're doing them and even before that they were done 
just on a straight informational basis. If suddenly 22%, just one nation, not the 10 that he spoke of, or maybe the 6 that could come along with the idea, but just if one nation suddenly took 22% of the annual budget out and abrupt decisions are kind of an hourly occurrence in Washington now. Huh. If that occurred, it would be a shock to the system. I, I have already seen the shock playing out in the Palestinian Authority, where first they threatened, and then they re-threatened, and then they said, well, then we're going to threaten, <laughs> and now they're not so sure what they're going to do. Uh, I heard Saeb Arakat today say in an interview with Newsweek, God help us, we, we don't know what's going to, going to happen. I think the answer is a shock to the system. I remember Ban Ki-moon on uh, New Year's Eve when someone from Fox inter interviewed him and said, you know, we're giving all this money to the UN. And Ban Ki-moon says, yes, and we're very grateful. So that's a great idea. Let me take You know, uh, I just, I was thinking about Durban too. So I have to say, I, I attended Durban 2 and Durban 3. We were here in New York. Um, and, and it's making me think, I don't know how many are going to come along. But what I do know is that for things like this, uh, we need a movement. So, I mean, a break off or changes or defunding, defund the UN, get the, get the U.S. out of the UN, get the, get the UN out of the U.S., all these things, even though, you know, the property issue. But forget that for a moment. There needs to be an acknowledgement that now is the time for accountability and people will not know to do this unless a movement begins. And for a movement to begin, there has to be a, a tipping point. There has to be information flow. There has. So what you're doing is really important. Whether or not you <laughs> actually <laughs> create this new model it is not as important as a possible movement that you are trying to create to bring awareness uh, of all of this. Look what you've done in 50 days. I mean, it's pretty remarkable. Do you understand what he's done in 50 days? And he's traveling around. And he, so bringing awareness to this issue and, and letting people understand how corrupt and, and, oh, my God, I will tell you the one thing that I did think about. You know, just sitting here, I was reminiscing about Durban, too, when I was in Europe. Uh, she's Iraq. speaking about the International Conference to End Racism, which was nothing but a racist conference. Did you go? Did you go? No, I was the one who did the investigation of the Ford okay. Foundation funding it all. Okay. <laughs> Let me ask you, was anybody there in Geneva? No. Okay, I was there. But what was so nice about it was that it was it was really the first time uh, in in the 15 years before 2009 that I had seen all the Jewish organizations working together <laughs> against the Durban II um, event. And Alan Dershowitz was there, and everybody was there together. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and it made a difference. It made a difference uh, for the the uh, credibility issue of Durban too. It made a difference. It made a clown out of them. Actually, a clown came in and threw a nose at Ahmadinejad. <laughs> right. He did. A All clown right. came in and threw a nose. So right, we need a movement. The League of Nations was begun with a single speech. Wilson's fourteen points. The United Nations was begun with a small scrap of paper and a, and, a, and a few sentences signed by five delegates. The Covenant of Democratic Nations, the conversation has begun.